Okay, any questions about last session? I had a question about uh, this uh, YOLO paper. Yes, um, sure. When, so like on the bottom left, when it's talking about sort of the overall process, um, when, when we say if the center of an object falls into a grid cell, that grid cell is responsible for detecting that object. Um, I guess, like does each grid cell, I don't know, could you just explain that a little more? I'm confused like what each grid cell is doing maybe. Uh, so each grid cell, let's take this one, is predicting uh, the coordinates for B boxes. So let's say it's predicting two boxes. So it's, it has two boxes associated with it. Each box is gonna have four coordinates, X, Y, W, and H. And then it has a confidence score. Uh, is there an object here or not? And then at the same time, it's gonna predict C classes. It's gonna predict a vector of probabilities. Given that there is an object in this box, uh, what object that is. So that's what each cell is doing. This is during inference. So each box, for instance, let's take this car here. Let's take this, the center of that, that cell. It's predicting two boxes. So two of these boxes that we see is being predicted by this guy. And then the confidence is being denoted by the thickness of the lines, thickness of the edges. So it's predicting that. And then at the same time, this box is predicting even given that there is an object in this box, what is its class? And this is the best class. And then we just multiply this by those boxes and then do non-maximum separation to kill most of those boxes. And then you're going to end up with a single box. So that's during inference. Mm -hmm. You need something to train this. What is your loss function? What is your training data per each box? We know that there is no object here. Mm -hmm. This shouldn't be responsible for this dog here or the bike or the car. So that, that's a negative example. Mm -hmm. But this box here is responsible for predicting the car. Mm -hmm. You're labeling your data. So that one is going to be labeled with a car. And then that's the one that is going to enter in your objective function. And so the idea is that on test data, the network, like if this image with the dog and the car was a test image, the network would be able to identify that there was a dog object, and then it would be able to associate the center of that object with a certain grid cell, and then only look at that grid cell for the bounding box? So no, this part that I'm saying, if the center of an object falls into a grid oh, cell. Oh, that's only for inference. That's for training only. Or, yeah, sorry, yeah. This is only for training. Okay. The inference is very straightforward. Each of these guys is going to predict these many numbers, B times 5 plus C, and then the rest of it is just multiplying these two together. Okay, even if, okay, so even like some, some grid cell at the bottom right where there is no object would still be presenting B, for B bounding boxes for, for each class. Exactly, so there is a box here, it's being predicted, and it has a corresponding class, but then the non-maximum separation is going to kill it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, once one problem is that the the confidence is very low, mm -hmm. and that's gonna kill the box. Okay. Doing non-maximum separation. And then together, all of the grid cells for the dog are like combining to get one final sort of bounding box for the dog overall. Even though there's multiple grid cells that are predicting bounding boxes there. Exactly. So in the end, after this step, you're gonna end up with a bunch of boxes. Yeah. And their corresponding class probability. And as you can see here, you're just multiplying them together. Then it's going to give you a class-specific confidence score. So how confident is this predicted box that there is a dog in there? Mm -hmm. And once you have that information, that's enough input, input to your non-maximum separation. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's okay. during inference. But what you're seeing here is for training. Yeah, yeah. Because this is a method of labeling your data. Mm -hmm. What is your data? What is the corresponding data, how do you want to train it? And then we also have another trouble is that many of these boxes that you see here, there is no object in them. You have class imbalance. And many of them are just uh, not responsible for any object. That's why you have to downweight the loss for those many examples, those many boxes that there is no object in them during training. Mm -hmm. 
But once the training is done, the rest of it is very simple. Each grid is gonna predict a bunch of boxes, their corresponding components, you multiply, and then you do non-maximum separation. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's fast. Yeah, yeah. So it, it doesn't have two stages. Any other questions? Yeah, so just this also means that there's a uh, maximum number of objects, right? Because we can't get any more than S times S times B boxes, right? Yes, so this is the maximum number of boxes that you get. S times S times B per each image. And that's actually a very great point. This is a good segue to the next paper. What if you want to look at multiple scales and at the same time you want to end up with more boxes? What would you change? And I'm sure many of you have heard about SSD, single shot multi-box detector. At least it's one of the benchmarks in MLPerf, so machine learning performance. And that's where these companies and then they compete whether their algorithm is better than them. another algorithm, whether their hardware is better than another hardware, whether their implementation is better. So SSD is one of those benchmarks. And uh, let's see how it is different and how does it push the state of the art. So the objective with SSD at that time, 2016, was that you had faster RCN and then you had YOLO. YOLO is very fast, but it's not that accurate. And then you have faster RCNN, which is really accurate, but is not as fast as uh, YOLO. So they wanted to come up with an algorithm that has the best of the two worlds. It's faster than YOLO, and it's more accurate than faster RCNN. So it has to be a single stage. So it's going to be a single stage algorithm. But how does it build upon the ideas in YOLO? So let's not worry about this figure for now. Let's worry about this one. So I'm going to go from bottom to top because we covered YOLO. Another way to think about YOLO, we saw previously that on the original image, we were creating uh, a seven by seven grid. If, we, if I go back, this S was seven and that's your grid, S by S. But you were doing it on the original image. Another way to think about it is that if you push it through your network, in the end, you're going to end up with a 7 by 7 by 30 feature map. And these are going to be responsible for your boxes. Every pixel in your feature map is going to correspond to a cell on your original image. And what is this num where is this number 30 coming from? 30 is coming from, uh, you have, this is 7 by 7. Then B is 2. 2 times 5 is 10. And you have 20 classes that you're predicting. That's going to give you 30. So that's exactly the output of your YOLO. It means that you're gonna have 98 boxes per image. I don't think it's class. It's 98 boxes per image. And then you do non-maximum separation. And this is during inference. An image goes in, you're gonna end up with 98 boxes, you do non-maximum separation, and then you report your results. So the idea of SSD is that not only you can look at this feature map, but you can look at other feature maps in your base network. And let's say your base network is VGG16. So you can look at multiple feature maps in your layers at different depths. One of them could be this 38 by 38 by 512. This is going to give you 38 by 38 boxes. And let's say each one is predicting four or six boxes. Here you had four boxes per each pixel. Actually, you had two boxes per each pixel. Here you can have four or six, and that's exactly what you see here. Each feature map, each uh, pixel in your feature map is going to predict four boxes or six boxes. And these are at different scales. So one of them is at a feature map of eight by eight. The other one is at a feature map of four by four. This would be at a feature map of 38 by 38, then 19 by 19, 10 by 10, 5 by 5, 3 by 3, and then the last one. In the end, you're going to end up with more boxes, 8,732 boxes. And then you can do non-maximum separation on that. So this has a higher mean average precision compared to YOLO. And at the same time, it's faster. So is everything clear so far? Yes, no? Okay, perfect. So this is going to give us more boxes to work with at different scales, because we know that each feature map is uh, looking at different scales in our image. The receptive fields are different 
this last one is probably looking at the entire image and this one is looking at portions of the image. So where is this 8,732 coming from? There are four boxes that are being predicted and this is four times 38 by 38. These are the number of boxes from this layer. The number of boxes from this, this layer is six times 19 by 19. The ones from here is six times 10 by 10. The next one is, so you figure whenever it, on the arrow there is no, nothing written, it's just what you copy and paste from top. So it's gonna be six times five times five, plus four times three times three. And then this last guy is predicting four boxes with a huge field of view. And that's gonna be four times one by one. And in the end, if you add them up, it's gonna give you 8,732. Okay, that's one contribution. You are predicting more boxes. The other contribution is when you look at the loss function. Previously, we were doing a regression for our classification or for our confidence. Uh, now we can do actually a cross entropy loss for the classification part. And the regression part is the bounding box regression is a steel regression. So that's going to be our training objective. Let us start with this part with the localization part of the loss function. This is the ground truth box. This is the predicting box. And these are the four parameters of the boxes. And then X is an example, is an image, and that's gonna give you the loss of the localization. You have to balance the trade-off between localization and your confidence, which is um, a soft max. And then you have the number of matched default boxes. And if you look, this box here is being matched to the dog. These two boxes here are being matched to the cat and the rest of them are negative examples. And that's how you trade it. This is a soft max loss. And we learned about smooth L1 loss. And uh, this is more robust to outliers. The problem with these bounding box predictions is that you're gonna end up with a lot of outliers. So you need to have a regression loss that is sensitive, that is not that sensitive to outliers. So what's happening here is that you have L1 loss far from zero, and then near zero, it's gonna be L2. So there's a smooth transition from L1 to L2 and then L1 again. So it's not growing quadratically, far from zero, it's linear, okay? That's your training objective. And even if we go back, we had to deal with the same problem in YOLO as well, in the loss function. We had to take a square root of the width and the height of the entire image. And that's exactly the same problem because a small change, the same change on that big box is relatively smaller compared to the same change on a smaller box. That's why you, you have to do this. That's not the best way out of it, but it at least mitigates the problem. So you're having the same issue here, and it's just neater. You're dealing with L1. So it's linear outside the, outside the neighborhood. So what are these default boxes? Where are they coming from? What are their scales? And to which layer are we associating them? So let's say you have M layers, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five, this is six. You choose a minimum scale, let's say 0 0.02. You choose a maximum scale, let's say 0 0.9. And then you linearly interpolate from 0 0.2 until 0 0.9. So these are going to give you your scales. And then each one is going to be associated with a, a different layer. For layer one, you have the minimum scale. And then for the last layer, you have your maximum scale. These are the sizes of these boxes. And as you can see, for instance, it's eight by eight feature map. You are scaling it to have the same size as your original image so that these boxes are having the same size or similar size relative to the original image. It means that the deeper you go into your network, like you, this last one, you're gonna have a huge box for the entire image or a big portion of the image. So is the intuition there that at lower layers you're looking at larger scales and it, or sorry I, I guess at higher layers further in the network you're looking at larger scales exactly so earlier in the network you're looking at the smallest scales and when you go deeper you're looking at larger scales or larger objects in your image and that's how you associate them you have different scales and then for aspect ratio you pick a number from one two three or one half or one third these are going to be your aspect ratios 
this is one, two, three, four, five numbers. So these are gonna give us five boxes per each feature map. And then the width and the height, this is how you come up with them. You have your scale at this feature map, you know your aspect ratio. And basically if you divide that number by this number, this square root is gonna go away. And then you have these aspect ratios. The width is the same as the height. The width is twice as big as the height three times bigger than the height or the height is bigger than the width by two or three. So that's how you interpret this. And then there is another scale and that's gonna correspond to, this is gonna have an aspect ratio of one. And this is just another scale from one layer to the other one because there is gonna be a transition and you don't know which layer to associate that box to. You come up with the same aspect ratio and then that's just gonna be another scale in total. This is going to give you one, two, three, four, five, and six boxes per each feature map. These are your default boxes. But then how do you get these four? Most of them are six. This is six box, six box, six box. You have a bunch of fours here. They correspond to when you don't, when you remove three and one third. Once you have your boxes, then you train them. Once the training is done, you do your prediction, and then you do your non-maximum operation. And how does it compare to the landscape? So faster, our CNN is proposing 300 boxes, and these are different backbones, VGG16 versus ZF. ZF is the paper that was visualizing using deconvolutions. We have different mean average over mean average precision, and these are the number of frames per second that the faster our CNN can process, seven and 17. Yellow is much faster, it's 45 frames per second and 155 frames per second, but it has a lower mean average over precision. And these are different versions of SSD. These are probably deeper and wider. And in the end, this is the case that we consider 8,732 boxes. This is as fast as YOLO, and it's more accurate than faster RCN. And then you can play around with the number of boxes, actually the depth and the height of your network. So one way to make these networks faster is to use your GPUs. It means that if you increase your test batch size, rather than pushing one image at a time, push eight images at the same time. These are gonna be processed in parallel. That's gonna give you higher frames per second. And you see the mean average over precision. Mean average precision is the same. It's just processing eight images at the same time. Wait, so Professor, you said um, the the one third and three aspect ratios just get taken out for certain layers? Yes. Is that just because it's less useful for those layers or why is that? I think it's uh, if you have 38 by 38 and then you multiply it by six and probably it's a lot of boxes. It's gonna make your network slower. And we see that effect here. If you have more boxes, your network is slower. Yeah. So that's one reason. Any other questions? So these, default like we always have the same default boxes and then we're just selecting default boxes that we think exist in our image is that correct like we're not regressing for these these bounding boxes we're just like picking a box from our default set if it matches so it's similar to the idea of anchor boxes that we saw in past of our cinema okay and your network is gonna predict the coordinates that uh, that is gonna adjust these boxes. Okay, so it'll adjust it, but it'll kind of base it off that that baseline. Yes, and this is another thing that's different from YOLO. Yeah, YOLO is actually predicting. There are two boxes, and it's just predicting two of them. Okay. But here you have anchor boxes, and that's another reason that this network is more accurate because it's borrowing your ideas from faster RCNN also. Okay. And your study is also right. Uh, about why we don't do aspect ratios three and one over third. One answer was the computational cost. And the other one is that at these small scales, you probably don't need that many of them. I guess I meant the larger um, scales. Like when we're, when we're deep enough that the filters are only uh, two by two, mm -hmm. or I guess three by three, um, there's not much room for boxes that are three by one or one by three. Probably, yeah. And any other questions before I move to the next one? So we saw that borrowing ideas from like anchor boxes from uh, faster RCNN was being helpful in this paper. Then came YOLO, and this is some examples. 